Joining me in the Catalyst studio today is Samir Kareshi with The Knack. Welcome, sir. Thank you, sir. So I saw you at the Tampa Bay Waves demo day, and uh, they held you up as a success. Uh, you participated with the Wave, and it seemed like you're doing great. So that'll be interesting to have you contribute to one of our series called Origin Stories and get to know how The Knack started and uh, what brought you to where you are today. I'm um, sure. So kind of rewinding back, I grew up not too far from here. I'm in Palm Harbor area. So I went to school at Eastlake High School and ended up graduating, going to the University of Florida. But prior to that, I had the opportunity to earn my associate's degree in high school. So I went to St. Petersburg College full-time as a college student while I was in high school. And that was kind of my first foray into higher ed. Had the opportunity to run for student body president, ended up winning. So I was a student body president of the college while I was in high school. Nice. And so I had a really interesting opportunity to kind of see the inner workings of you know student life, student involvement at the community college level. And never did I think I would end up in higher ed technology. However, I just remember that being such a wholesome experience of being able to lead on campus as well as kind of surround myself with the networks of students that I really found to be encouraging. And so kind of going through and transitioning into a four-year institution at, at UF, I graduated as a pre-law student thinking I was going to go to law school. <laughs> and walked out in career fair one day and said, well, let me just kind of see what ends up coming out here and ended up getting a job at Apple. And so I was working on iOS product support, really starting to understand the trends in mobile. And that was really where I cut my teeth on technology and realized, you know, law would always be there, but technology was moving at such a fast pace that I wanted to get involved early. So I ended up leaving Apple and got a job at a company called Gartner, which is the world's largest IT consulting research firm. So there, um, you know, beyond technology, I got to work with startups. Um, I was managing and consulting C-level executives at startups. So really understanding their business, what growth levers were there, what sorts of activities they could do to position themselves in the market. And so I was kind of this liaison between uh, these analysts that were industry experts as well as startups. So I got to see kind of the both sides of where tech was going and again, what these sorts of companies were, were working like. So specifically when you were doing the consulting, that was with the, sort of your technology hat on? Yeah. So it was more of a sales, you know, account executive role, but there was a lot of kind of just helping these folks position themselves. And again, really intimately understanding their business. So it was all technology focused. So it's working with vendors that were selling into end users. So Gartner was kind of split on two sides. You have the vendors on one side, which would be, you know, technology companies, and you have end users, which would be any sort of company, Publix and Adidas, whoever that's buying technology. They rely on Gartner in the middle to kind of tell them who should we be talking to, what techs out there. So it was a really interesting role. Um, I ended up doing very well at the company. And as much as it was an amazing experience for me as a first kind of true full-time job, I kind of felt like I could do a lot more with something more impactful. And so, you know, tying again this back to my personal story, growing up, um, I used a lot of tutoring and my mom was actually one of my first tutors. And I just, you know, remember how that personalized attention could really aid me. I was told at a very early age that my academic track was going to be poor, just given some analysis that they did. And so my mom was determined wrong. to prove them wrong <laughs> and was always kind of looking at ways where I could go above and beyond. And so I had the opportunity again to kind of go through some of that personalized learning experience and fast forwarding that into college, I'd go back to Gainesville to visit my best friend who's now my co-founder and, you know, would see him studying all the time, skipping football games saying, I got to find a tutor and it's been so difficult for me to do this. And so we started to really dive deeper into this problem. Education was important to me. I'm also a first generation immigrant. And so coming to the States, getting a college degree has always kind of been the forefront of my mom's purpose of bringing me here. And so I was really intrigued and we started to talk and, you know, ended up finding out that most college courses actually don't have tutoring services available. So, you know, your lower level classes at the university can do a great job in covering with their brick and mortars where they have tutors staffed. But as you get into your upper levels and as that even bleeds more so into mentoring and coaching, there's not a great mechanism to get help. And, and as a student, you know, jumping up and going to tutoring is not something you're very excited about doing. So we kind of set out on this mission to leverage a peer community. So taking the top performing students on a campus, empowering them with the opportunity to go and help other students on campus while driving that data flow back to the university to help them understand, you know, who's struggling and how can we put them on a track that's going to get them the help they need. But then who are the high achieving students and what are the soft skills that they're developing through these processes? We're making the connection that the better you are as a peer tutor or mentor or student leader, the better you are as a potential employee down the road, right? You have the soft skills around teamwork, collaboration, communication. So that eventually evolved into NAC, which today is the fastest growing peer learning platform for college students. So again, we'll go onto a campus, we'll recruit the top performers, put them on our platform. Uh, now we're starting to work with the universities to do this, but initially it was a direct to consumer route. And through that process, we've been able to launch 40 campuses at a pretty fast rate. 
and really kind of help students um, get to the next level, not just in the classroom, but at this point, even helping them find their next job. Sure. Would you consider Gartner a time when you, where your sort of entrepreneurial awareness grew when you saw what it took to run a company or did you always have sort of an entrepreneurial strain in you? Yeah. So a little bit of both. So in high school, I used to fix people's iPhones and, and hack them and, and uh, jailbreak them, if you will. And people would pay me all the time. So I really enjoyed kind of just being able to make my own money and, and not necessarily be accountable to anyone. In college, I had a t-shirt business that ended up just sunsetting out, but you know, it floated me through college. And so I think I was always intrigued with being my own boss. That as sounds pretty entrepreneurial. Most, yeah, the most elementary form. So that was kind of my excitement there. Both my mom and dad are small business owners. So I got to kind of witness the benefits of that, you know, having to be able to manage your own time. And, but when I got to Gartner, I got to speak with amazing entrepreneurs, folks that were working on, you know, IOT, wearable technology, really deep tech. And, and it was so kind of cutting edge that it got me excited to say, I could do law school at any point. So my plan was I'll go to Gartner, I'll do well, I'll save up some money and then go to law school because law school costs an arm and a leg. So once I got in, I just got too excited and I said, I'll do that later. So now here I am in tech. How did the initial conversations go with your friend who became your co-founder? Was it just the two co-founders at the beginning? And then how were you both in a place where you're able to invest the time and the capital to start standing up this platform? So, you know, Dennis was the uh, vice president of uh, the entrepreneurship club at UF. And so he had always had that strain in him too. He started a couple of businesses, actually one was a digital marketing one. He was managing a pretty large ad spend. So I knew he kind of had those skill sets inside and he was an engineering major. So I knew his ability to problem solve and reason was phenomenal. And I still to this, they look up to that. And so he was always somebody as a friend that, you know, we really hit it off as. And then as we started to really uncover this, I think we had a match in the way that we thought about things and, and our aspirations long-term. So Dennis was a student at that time. I was working at Gartner again, kind of coming to Gainesville on the weekends to catch Gator games. And when I would come to Gainesville again, I would notice Dennis being busy and we'd start to just kind of hash this idea out. And I said, this is something I'm serious about. You know, I, I love Gartner, but I think I love entrepreneurship more. And so Dennis said, well, you know, the university just opened the student incubator and it was the inaugural year and they're recruiting students like crazy to come in, launch their venture. They give you free space, free attorneys, et cetera. So he said, let's apply. So he applied, got the interview and we got accepted. And the rule was at least one person on the team has to be a student. So at that point it was Dennis and I had a friend named David, who's now our CTO, who I met in UF as well, pitched him on some ideas and there were failures, but we stayed in touch. His wife is actually a teacher. So she was in education. I, I said, Hey, I got something I want to talk to you about. So I pitched him over a call and he said, sounds interesting. Let's talk more about it. So he was working at Nielsen here in Tampa at the time. And when I was at Gartner, someone on my team named Sean, who's now our chief of marketing was one of the top salespeople there. And, you know, we would grab beer sometimes and talk about stuff. And one day I told him I was, had this idea and, you know, before you knew it, he said, I want to get involved. How can we do this? So brought these guys together and we said, all right, de facto office is going to be University of Florida. So we, Sean and I would commute from Fort Myers up to Gainesville on the weekends. And, you know, eventually I think we got to a point where, you know, we realized that we had the potential to really take this somewhere, but, you know, it wasn't necessarily fair to be splitting time on a full-time job and doing this. And so we made a decision to basically quit our jobs. And so Sean jumped ship first and uh, on the last day, got my sales bonus. I put in my two weeks and we all kind of threw in some bootstrap capital and moved up to Gainesville and started building the company more seriously. One kind of turning point there was as part of the hatchery is the name of the incubator there, we were required to enter into the business plan competition. So we applied and um, kind of hacked together a business plan and we ended up winning first place. And that was a 25K cash prize. And that was kind of our Trojan horse into raising venture capital. And so in the audience was one of the fund managers for Eric Schmidt's fund, Innovation Endeavors, as well as some other just kind of high net worths who said, hey, this is a really interesting idea. You should come out to San Francisco. There's a lot of capital for stuff like this. So, you know, next thing you know, we're out on a flight, came back with uh, a $200,000 term sheet from a venture capital fund who has uh, been incredible in letting us build our company here in Florida. Who made that trip out there with you? So it was me initially. And then the VC actually committed over the phone before I even met him. And, you know, the advisor that connected us, I said, is this typical? Like, you know, is this the right thing to do? And he said, if this guy gave you his word, he's someone that's really well respected. So I flew out there, we met in person and signed a term sheet. My team met me out there. And then, um, you know, the plan was we'll temporarily come back to Florida because this was two and a half years ago. The velocity of which these ecosystems are changing is crazy. There was very little capital in Tampa or even Florida. So we said, it's going to be tough to get capital. So, you know, we were scraping up pitch competition money, free 25K grants and ended up getting a grant from the Teal Foundation. And so 
we started to really think about how we were going to raise capital. And so actually last summer I moved out to San Francisco and, you know, I just had a hard time finding capital here. Sure. And so while I was out there, I got to really interface and learn more about the true fundraising process. And at the end of the day, I just felt like it was still a pricey place to be. And the market here in Tampa was a lot more exciting from the fact that startups are kind of newer. And so we were lucky enough to get some great conversations with some funds here. And we'll be closing out our seed round, which is oversubscribed next week at uh, almost $2 million. Fantastic. When you first brought the uh, founders into the company, can you talk a little about how the conversations went around dividing up the, you know, the equity and then lit the cash overlaying into that? Because obviously I'm, I'm assuming not everybody put in the same amount. And obviously you were, you know, longer into it than everybody else. So how did that work out? Yeah. I mean, everyone did put in the same amount. I think that was the way we kind of even the playing field. Got it. But prior to that, you know, this is candidly everyone's first venture. So, you know, I think for us as founders, while capital returns and making a lot of money is great, I think what matters to us more is just being able to say we won, right? We get a win under our belt. And that obviously would be ideal if it was a $100 million, billion dollar exit. But we're kind of in this, I think, for an intrinsic motivation, not necessarily for the money. And so while, you know, shareholders and investors do want to hold you to revenue, and that is 100% our plan. I think what we were excited about was this is a business where there's not just an immediate potential, you know, capital gain, right? This is from our perspective, a social impact business as well, where we're actually empowering college students to create their own, you know, mentoring, tutoring, and assistance businesses on our platform and empowering to hopefully better the education system and help students graduate. So I think we had a larger mission in mind. And at one point, you know, we were trying to figure out equity and what have you. And at one point we said, all right, well, you know, Samir gets more because he had the idea. And then, you know, we were kind of talking about it at one point, you know, I think Sean suggested, he said, Hey, you know, why don't we just make it equal? And, um, you know, I did some research on it. Y Combinator's done a lot of great articles around kind of equity splits and, and, you know, we didn't think that it was atypical to do that. And so from an equity standpoint, we're actually all equal as partners. That's great. It's kind of romantic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then as far as the first round that came in after that was the 200K from out West, was there any connection between the valuation, you know, in the first round, I guess, that was just sort of an arbitrary amount that you guys put in the same amount to each other than how did you start to go about uh, valuing the company for that 200K? I mean, it's always an art, not a science. And I think valuation is in traditional businesses or real estate or even private equity deals, it's usually an EBITDA multiplier, right? And so when you have just an idea and a few guys that, you know, have some very promising stories, but not a lot to show for it and not even, an, you know, really any experience. I worked in a Fortune 500 for not even a year. And so I think part of the reason we had a hard time raising capital was because we couldn't get folks to agree on terms that we thought were fair, mm-hmm. right? And so to us, it made sense, well, we'll make it work with less money or we'll make it work ourselves rather than just giving up a ton of our company. So, you know, we were lucky enough that we were able to get a West Coast market rate of valuation, which I still think is, you know, they are slightly inflated, but I do think, you know, generally they have a good sense of what a company's worth. And so we were able to get, you know, a general kind of pre-seed valuation, which in the San Francisco market's anywhere from about a million to 4 million. So we're right around in that range. And that was on a safe note, which is essentially a version of a convertible note that Y Combinator pioneered. So that was incredible because we were able to sign the docs in two hours and we didn't have to worry about a bunch of legal paperwork. And then that safe then converted in our next equity round, which is this round today. So, you know, it was kind of a, just getting folks to agree on a number that we felt was kind of validated based on the size of the team, the experience, some of the, you know, traction we had had. We launched our product before we raised money. And so I think we had proven that we could build something that people liked. And it was really kind of to beef up marketing and really truly kind of find that compass of product market fit, which is where we're still at. And I think we're getting closer and closer every day. So what will the post money valuation be once you've closed this round? I can't disclose that. Secret. All right. From a development standpoint, or even just from a business standpoint, what have been the biggest hurdles to overcome since you guys started? I think just kind of speed, right? And velocity. So I think everyone as a startup or even from an investor standpoint, they want to see, you know, two, 300% year over year growth, right? Or 10% week over week growth. And while that sounds somewhat attainable, you'll realize that it's usually not as simple as you think. And so, you know, what's interesting about our business is we started out direct to consumer where we're a marketplace business. We make our money from a 20% service fee that comes from this each tutoring or mentoring session that takes place. Over time, we started to realize that college students, one, are not usually the ones that like to spend a lot of money. And if they do, it's absolutely not on tutoring. <laughs> So we started to notice the folks that were interested in who are the stakeholders that truly cared about these students' success. First one were the parents, right? And you did have some students that were paying out of pocket. I mean, they still do on our platform. Those are usually the ones that are really motivated and care about their grades. 
But what's interesting is a community we started to develop on our platform ended up being this mixture of students that were really academically motivated on one side as those needing help. And then those that have already proven their academic kind of proficiency as tutors or mentors. So we started to look at this data. We noticed that our tutors were going off to great companies, the Facebooks, the Apples world, because they have the great grades. They're great at communicating and teaching. So, you know, we started to figure out how could we get this business to a place where, you know, revenue is a bit more sustainable and what stakeholders existed. So we had parents coming in buying packages and we started to get folks coming out of the blue. We had student loan companies coming out saying, we want to fund this because it's our incentive to make sure these students graduate so they pay their loans back. Right. And so that started to get us thinking that there are a lot of other people here that care about this nonprofits that care about, you know, specifically sponsoring affinity groups like first generation students. And so, you know, what we've really kind of come full circle on on this business is that really what we're creating is a community of peer support, right? Where it's not just tutoring, it kind of blurs into mentoring, advising, coaching. It's this wraparound support that when you get to college on day one, if you use NAC and it's your holistic student support platform to get help in the classroom, out of the classroom, ultimately that's keeping you on track for universities to reach their performance-based funding metrics, which are student graduation rates and now college to career transitions. So we started to really focus in on that in the last couple, probably about last six months. And we started to receive some inbound from universities saying, hey, we have a tutoring center on campus, but we can't cover all the courses, right? But we don't want to turn these students away. So UCF reached out and said, can we subsidize your service for our students, right? So they basically bought gift cards for every student, gave them away. Students really love the product, right? We have a 99% satisfaction rating. We just knew that they shouldn't be the ones paying for this. And again, our mission with that social impact kind of viability is we want to make sure no matter who you are, you have access and affordability to this platform. So we've really shifted our focus on passing that cost off to employers who are willing to fund this as a way to build brand awareness with students. And then schools who want to offer this as an amazing service for their students. So other than changing who you know, pays for it, what other functionality have you added or do you plan to add to sort of support this new understanding of the value proposition? There's a lot that we're doing actually that we're changing. So today our product is just mobile first. And so we're, we'll be releasing our web app in the next few months here, hopefully. Everything we do today is in person. So it's online to offline, meaning you book online like an Uber or an Airbnb, but you meet up in person. And so We've always been big proponents of if we can kill it and in person, online becomes easy, right? If we start online, there's no way we could ever do in person. And to our kind of preference, we still think in person is the best experience. And so we're going to have to do a lot of overhauling to make sure we can cover and support every single student on campus, whether you're distance learning or local. We're also going to be, again, releasing our web application. We're kind of revamping our matching algorithm to be kind of more based on learning styles and preferences. So Definitely got no shortage of work to do. Dennis and David will tell you that our backlog is running forever. But at the end of the day, I think we've accomplished a good amount building a simple product that is built by former students, right? And we're not too old and we were recently in the classroom. And so our mission was we always wanted to build the product for the student and then figure out how the administrators and everyone else fit in for later. Because if the students don't like it, it doesn't really matter. You mentioned that uh, you have some connections with potential funding, but can come together on the valuation. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about during that whole process, you know, maybe people that you were close to working with and what maybe made you opt to not work with them or what were your criteria when deciding who you wanted to take money from other than valuation? Yeah. So honestly, I think, and this is just kind of my rule of thumb, whether it's an investor, an advisor, a mentor, or an employee, we just hired a couple of people, our first two employees one of our first couple employees. And, you know, I've always said that beyond kind of, you know, making sure they know their stuff, whether it's a hard skill in coding or, you know, marketing, what have you, we want to work with people that we'd love to be friends with too, right? People that I can go out and hang out with. And I, I don't feel like there's any friction or weirdness, right? And so our investors today, one of our investors is the founder of Hired.com, which is the largest recruiting marketplace. You know, he invited me over to have dinner with his family. We went out to a concert together and this guy's exited probably about a billion dollars worth of business in South Florida. So he kind of flies under the radar, and but he's somebody that I, I look up to and somebody that I really can learn from. And I, I think we as a team, because we're so young, we have a ton to learn. I've never run a company before. I didn't even study business. And so for me to be able to be around people that I really get along with and enjoy, and you know, there's always bad apples in every market. And I think we've not just in Tampa, but all over New York, Boston, San Francisco, I've met people where, you know, despite the terms not coming together, there's just other things that we don't really see eye to eye on. And so we felt a little bit of that, but again, that's going to happen. It's business. And so it's no hard feelings and nothing heated, but at the end of the day, I think, you know, just didn't feel easy about it. So at the end of the day, I think you want to work with people, especially from an investment standpoint that you really, really trust, right? Trust is paramount. 
And so we're really excited to be kind of announcing this round in the next week or two here of who's involved, because there's some amazing people that, you know, haven't just done great work in the world of startups, but have been amazing philanthropists outward too. Cool. And um, just one, because I, I uh, follow Peter Thiel, when you interacted with his foundation, what was that process like? How did you come into that connection? Yeah. So I graduated UF early because I came in with my associate's degree and they have this program called the Thiel Fellowship, where they basically pay you $100,000 to drop out of school and build something, right? And Peter Thiel's whole kind of thesis is that, you know, college is something students go to to figure things out. And most of them come out still not knowing what they want to do, but racked up a bunch of debt. And, you know, despite us being in the higher ed space, I would agree with a lot of those things, though I do think university landscape's changing very quickly. So I had applied to this while I was at Gartner. I graduated, but I thought maybe they'd just let me in. You had to be under 23 or 23 or under either in school or dropped out. And, you know, you had to have some idea. And so I applied. I actually did a joint application. I don't even know if I told Dennis this. I wrote the application, but I kind of combined both of us because I felt like I met the age requirement. I, Dennis is a year older than me. However, he was still in school. So he was still in school and I met the age requirement. So I kind of applied with him. I mean, I said, this is what we're working on. And, you know, they ended up getting back to me and said, this is really awesome. But, you know, you really do have to not be in school anymore. And you got to, we don't want people with degrees. So they said, but we'll tell you what, we hold the summit every year, which is only for the fellows. And then we'll invite some, you know, really cool entrepreneurs there. So I think one of the angel investors of Pandora and eBay were there and some really amazing people. So they said, why don't you come out in San Francisco and there's a pitch competition and you'll just meet some amazing people. Dennis and I show up there. And there's 12, 13 year olds coding with Google glasses on and just some incredible people. And that was our first time coming to San Francisco where our mind was just blown. In any case, the last day there was a demo day pitch and um, I don't remember how many teams competed, but Dennis and I just said, hey, we've been working on this. We have traction or at least some basic of a product. So we applied and we pitched, we ended up winning and it was a small grant, it was a thousand bucks, but it was from the Teal Foundation. And so we kind of got the chance to start mingling within that network. And one of our first advisors, informal advisors kind of came out there and helped you know, steer us along and ended up being that individual from Pandora and eBay. And so, you know, that I think, again, from a building a company standpoint, you want to surround yourself with people that not just inspire you, motivate you, but have experience, right? And so these are people that have built incredible companies. So, you know, the Teal Network is one of a kind. And um, what I love is that the people involved are so young. Well, you've had a, you have a great company, but you've had a very charmed funding process, you know, getting a, a deal in advance of even going out to California, breaking the rules with your application and then getting invited out and then winning the competition. That's really fantastic. It's a great story. Appreciate that. So what's giving you meaning right now and what are you looking forward to in the next year or so after you close this round? Yeah. So we're really excited to really focus on a couple of new elements of our business. So one is that, you know, we're working more intimately with universities now where they're actually licensing the technology, having us come on their campus and really, you know, help build these student support networks around coaching, mentoring, tutoring, advising. But again, I think what's really, really cool about our product that you won't find in the marketplace is that everything is student to student. So we're basically taking a student that's been in the shoes of another and empowering them to go kind of assist this other student who you sat in the same seat with and you may be able to offer a hand to. So I think there's this altruistic mission that a lot of schools are coming around to listening to and not necessarily being as afraid as they were prior. And so it's taken, you know, almost three years to get around to that. But the other piece that's really great is employers are coming in and actually funding these sessions. So a lot of them will say, we're going to come in, we're going to cover the cost of certain sessions. So for instance, we just signed a deal with PwC and ConnectWise here locally. And they're coming in and PwC said, any accounting session, we're going to cover the cost of. The way we're going to do it is we're going to back the tutors that we like and have them go out and tutor other students. The benefit is that it's a dual impact. One, we're putting money in the tutor's pocket. And by nature of that, the student on the receiving end, the 2T, if you will, doesn't have to pay for that session anymore. So it's this kind of hybrid of corporate social responsibility and impact mixed with kind of a natural brand awareness solution for them. And then at the end of the day, they're getting kind of this fast track lane to meeting some great students on campus, which we, you know, hopefully end up seeing going into that organization. So that's a really cool model too, is that universities really like, we're not just again, focused on retention and helping the student in the classroom. It's also how do they build the skills that are important for the workforce? So we've really added this element quite recently and have seen some really amazing success stories already. And so I think as time goes on, we iterate the model and start to listen more to our customers, universities, and employers for feedback. We're just super excited to see how this scales. Wonderful. Congratulations on your success this far. And thank you for sharing your origin story. Thank you.